Britain's power and influence has declined since the beginning of the century. And the question is, is this a trend we can reverse? We are concerned with making money. That is what we, that is what we are trying to do. It's been described as the most beautiful terrace house in London. The abuse of business and financial power. You lied. We shall have a harder Christmas than we have known since the war. Economic activity is best left to the private sector, with market forces being encouraged to operate. The coronation of Queen Elizabeth II was a triumphant assertion of Britain's power in the world. But it was held in a city that was still ruined from the bombing of ten years before. Britain had been bankrupted by the war, and many of those clustered around the new Queen knew that it could no longer afford to rule the world. But one man in the crowd was determined that Britain should remain great and powerful. And if the old ways would no longer work, then he would find a new way. He was Colonel David Stirling, a war hero famous for founding the Special Air Service, the SAS. What Stirling would do was to sell to other countries Britain's military power. Britain would supply them with modern weapons and with mercenaries who would fight their wars for them. In return, Britain would become rich again and continue to influence the world. On the 14th of December, 1941, a small party of British troops made their way cautiously onto the enemy airfield of Tamit in the Western Desert. It was a pitch black night and they were moving carefully for the very good reason that they were hundreds of miles behind Rommel's front line. And they belonged to an organization called the SAS, Special Air Service. They were really a private army, started, trained, and led by a young subaltern called David Stirling. David Stirling came from a Scottish aristocratic family. With the SAS, he had invented a new revolutionary way of fighting a war. He had shown that with only a few men, he could destroy hundreds of enemy aircraft. To the army commanders, his methods were reckless but to his supporters, it was a return to a golden age of British heroism. The airfield was packed with aircraft, and they roared onto it with all guns blazing, the real Nelson touch, in fact. Now, the only way that I can bring this alive for you is by a demonstration which I've fixed up on this model for you to see what happened. Most of them had beards. A lot of them wore bandana handkerchiefs. They must have looked very like 18th century pirates. Now, what I always wonder is how do men like this make out in peacetime? After the war, David Sterling left the army and went to live in Rhodesia. Like many returning servicemen, he found post-war Britain drab and depressed. Sterling also believed that his duty was to help maintain Britain's empire. It was what he, like so many others, 
had fought to preserve. He believed that he had the, I mean, as the sort of thing that families like mine believed anyway, until fairly recently, probably. I mean, that you had, that you were powerful. You had, you had the, that your birth, that your birth uh, gave you the right to, to power, but also also gave you very great responsibilities looking after the people who lived on the place or worked on the place. It's just in the blood, I think, too, you know, there is, it's a birth thing. It's a birth thing. The British do not give independence or freedom to anybody on the platter. <laughs> You have to fight them for it. You must be prepared to go to prison. To face prison imprisonment or even death itself. They do not give it to you as a present. In the 1950s, black nationalism spread through Africa. To try and stop it, Sterling set up his own political party called Capricorn Africa. He proposed an alternative form of power sharing where people like himself would civilise the black majority. It attracted wide support among the white middle class settlers, but it was firmly rejected by politicians in London. There are many people who take what you might call a sort of paternalist view about the African in Africa. They say, and this no doubt is true, uh, that the European, for the time being at least, because of his greater knowledge and know-how and the rest of it, can run things better. And then they jump from that to assume that the European should stay there in control. Now, I've never accepted this analysis. It was about 50 years ago that um, Asquith said that uh, self-government is better than good government, and I believe this to be true. At the end of the 50s, Stirling returned to London. He was angry and disillusioned with the politicians. He felt they had lost the will to maintain Britain's power abroad. He also had nothing to do. He spent his time in Mayfair at private gambling parties. Four, giving you three, is drawing a card. The parties were arranged by another young aristocrat, John Aspinall. I first met David Sterling when a friend of mine brought him along to one of my games. David, as a gambler, was very brave, reckless, of course, as you would expect, dangerous, because those sort of gamblers always are. He was quiet, but menacing in a funny sort of way. So with David, you always knew he'd strangled 41 men, and therefore it gave the man an aura. One wondered how many throats he'd slit. In 1962, John Aspinall opened his own gambling club, the Claremont Club in Mayfair. Sterling was one of its members. The Claremont was deliberately designed to recreate a time when Britain had been rich and powerful. It's, I think the most, it's been described as the most beautiful terrace house in London, uh, built between 1742 and 1744 um, by William Kent, the royal, at that time, the royal architect, for Prince Freddie of Wales, who would have been King of England um, if he'd lived, but he died, I think, at the age of 39, for his mistress, the beautiful Isabella Finch Hatton. trying to recreate some sort of 18th century world. The beauty of the decorations, the colour of everything, the abandon, the sheer extravagance of it. And it was an atmosphere and an ambiance where strange plants could grow. The set that Aspinall gathered around him at the Claremont were like Sterling, disaffected right-wingers. Men who felt themselves out of tune with the consensus politics of the post-war world. They included James Goldsmith, a playboy and ferocious gambler who was to become a close friend of Sterling's. The tycoon, Tiny Rowland, who Sterling already knew from his time in Africa. Lord Lucan, 
a descendant of the man who had led the charge of the Light Brigade. 